with that, we're going to get there eventually, but I'd like you to start by turning in your Bibles to page number one, Genesis chapter one. So we're going to turn there together, uh, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But I would like to pray for us, pray for the message, and uh, give some introductory remarks before we read our text. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are uh, the God who hears and the God who sees and the God who uh, concerns himself with such as us. And Lord, help us to never take that truth uh, lightly. We ask now that you would bless the, the hearing of your word and the teaching of your word, that we would be refreshed and edified and that we would uh, worship you the better for this time that we spend here together. We ask these things in your name. As seems to have been a little bit of a habit for me. I've got a little bit of a, a parenthetical aside in the opening remarks. I'd like to issue a correction uh, on myself. Uh, I believe personally that corrections should be just as loud as the mistake. And so uh, I'll take this, this opportunity. A month ago, I was up here teaching about the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. And I drew this, this parallel point between the uh, Passover lamb and the Lord Jesus, and how both were examined for a period of time for any spots or blemishes. And I sort of parked on the on the idea that this Passover lamb was in the house for 14 days. 14 days. Uh, further study, and uh, an astute brother pointed out to me that the lamb was in fact in the house for four days. Uh, the point still stands, I think, but I was in error in fact there. And uh, I would just like to, to use that as an opportunity to highlight the point that while God does use uh, ministers of the gospel to teach his word, uh, men are, in fact, fallible. We recognize that God's word is infallible, uh, but men are fallible. And so I would encourage you, uh, like the Bereans, uh, to examine the scriptures as we go through them, to check them. We see in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, that these, the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so, as we study the scriptures, we invite you to study them yourselves uh, and to examine to see that these things are so. And particularly in a subject, or in a, uh, a series like this, where we're studying systematic theology, we're taking the truths of the Bible and sort of arranging them logically instead of going through a particular book uh, and looking at the full context of a passage, we're taking representative samples from different parts of Scripture to see what the overall truth is. And there's benefit to that, but there's also great risk in that, in that sometimes it can be easy to uh, overlook a doctrine that you might find difficult or to, to sort of skim over some other truths. And so uh, I would encourage you, please, uh, examine my words, examine John's words, examine the words of any teacher against the light of Scripture. Um, and so that's enough of that. I've got 12 pages of notes, so I'm going to be sort of editing on the fly here. And also, forgive me if I'm looking down, because we're talking about the Trinity tonight, and uh, the Trinity is some deep, deep water, uh, and there's heresy on either side of the buoy. And so I want to try to stick fairly close to my, to my notes here. You may have noticed that uh, for the last couple of weeks, John's been sort of giving me the side eye every time this subject comes up, because the Trinity is indeed a big, big topic. And the question, one of the first questions is, where do you even start? Where do you begin a discussion of the infinite God? Uh, and I would like to sort of suggest to you that we've been doing it this whole time. And so I'd like you to think of this lesson uh, as a bridge, if you will, from where we've been to where we're, where we're going. If you'll remember, if you've been following along or if perhaps you've looked at the tapes, we started uh, this series by looking at the Word of God, that it's uh, infallible and inerrant and sufficient, 
and so on. And so the, the word of God, the scriptures are where we get our truth about God. And then from there, we uh, went into a study about God the Father, and we looked at his nature, his character, his personality, his attributes, and then we did the same for the Son. And we recently finished with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in reality, that whole time, in a sense, we've been talking about the Trinity. And so today we're going to take all of those notions that we've been talking about and bring them together into this, this idea. Hence the start at Genesis 1, where uh, we're looking at the nature of God uh, to begin. So tonight our objective is to start right at page 1. We're going to discuss the nature of God as we see it there in the creation narrative. And then we're going to progress through the Old Testament, and I'd like to demonstrate to you briefly that uh, the Trinity, while it is uh, fully known uh, in the New Testament, it is by no means novel. We do see allusions to it in the Old. And so we're going to spend a surprising amount of time in the Old Testament tonight demonstrating that concept, and then we'll move briefly into the New Testament. We're going to see several passages where the three persons of the Trinity, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are mentioned in company with each other, and we're going to look at what we can learn from that. And then we're going to sort of close out with uh, some thoughts on what we're not saying, and then uh, a bit of a devotional thought there at the end. It's worth noting uh, that the Trinity is something that uh, Christians have held to uh, since the ink was still wet in the New Testament, but the word Trinity itself does not actually appear in the scriptures. This is uh, one of the difficulties you might run into if you talk to people who don't hold to that Trinitarian doctrine, that one of the first things you'll hear them say is, yes, but the word Trinity doesn't appear. That's true. We have the, uh, the church father Tertullian, circa 200 AD, uh, to thank for coining the phrase, but uh, he believed, and I agree with him, that the thought, the doctrine, is uh, eminently biblical, and that it is uh, saturated in the New Testament. And so, uh, we are going to sort of rely on the fact that we've established this, this basis on uh, the personality and the deity of each of those three members of the Trinity earlier in our studies. Um, so now with those introductory remarks complete, let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Page 1, chapter 1, verse 1, first sentence. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated from the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Sometimes I think, I fear that uh, we get so wrapped up in, the, in how remarkable the creation narrative is uh, that we look at it only in the narrative aspect and we uh, can neglect to realize that this is actually giving us a fair bit of data about God. And so let's look at this passage together uh, and see what sort of data it tells us about uh, this God that we worship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Excuse me. I'm going to get back on my notes here because I don't want to stray too far. <laughs> As we've said, it can fairly be said that a study of the Trinity is simply another way to express the study of God. God reveals a great deal about himself in the Old Testament. And perhaps nowhere in all of Scripture, I would suggest to you today, do you get more data packed in a simple sentence than that one on the board right there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is a very very data-rich sentence, I would suggest to you. What do we see here? We see that there was a beginning, that time and space, uh, matter and creation had a, a point of origin in time. Further, we see that God pre-existed that. So just from that statement alone, uh, we gather uh, that there is something outside of time and space. Uh, scripture would go on to describe this as eternity, uh, and that uh, we understand that God is an eternal being. He's outside of time and space. So even that in the beginning God tells us that uh, God is eternal. He is outside of time and space. Next we see that he creates. Um, since he's the one creating, that means he's outside of the created order. 
uh, this naturally sort of puts a ceiling on our understanding because we are within the created order and we naturally understand things within the created order. Uh, since we are created to operate and understand primarily within the created order, this necessarily means that we're going to bump our heads, as I just said that, uh, very rapidly. Notice quickly in verse 2, it says, the Spirit of God was hovering on, this, on the surface of the earth. This tells us something about the makeup of God, something that we're going to see more fully as we move through the scriptures. Uh, we understand here that uh, God is spirit. Uh, we're going to see that again in a minute. Um, that he's not needing or possessing a physical form as we would conceive it. This is a major point of emphasis in the scriptures, and it's why we're told to make no images of God, because he has no image, and therefore we could rightly perceive that any image we conceive is necessarily deficient. Jesus affirms in his teaching in John chapter 4 that God is spirit. So already we've seen that God is eternal, God is outside of the created order, and God is spirit. I would further suggest to you uh, that here in these first two verses we do have a bit of an allusion to the Trinity already. Uh, we see God uh, Elohim in the beginning, and then we see his spirit there in verse 2. This is a debated point. I'm not going to uh, hang my whole argument on it. Uh, that's just my opinion. Others have others. But I do see uh, a bit of Trinitarian reference here. Uh, and especially when you pair it with John chapter 1 and the fact that uh, John, the inspired apostle, uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, also places the Lord Jesus at this creation event and gives him credit for creation. I think we can fairly say uh, that the, the creation of the universe was indeed uh, a Trinitarian act, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all present. While it is a common belief, it's not universally shared, so we're not waiting, waste, hanging our entire weight of the case on the Trinity on this link. Something that uh, isn't immediately obvious uh, in our English Bibles is a bit of the grammar going on here. This is another interesting point. Um, we see in the beginning God, there at verse 1, that word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. It's interesting because Elohim is uh, a plural form of the noun for God. That suffix H-I-M, him, is a plural form. R.C. Sproul has this to say about it. The name Elohim has a plural ending. It always appears with singular verb form, so the writer is saying something that could not be interpreted to mean many gods. And so... Uh, there's a hint in the grammar that uh, there's this multifaceted uh, element to God, even though he is one. He acts in this singular verb form, but in his, in his noun, in his name, uh, there's uh, something of a multiplicity there. Uh, others see in this uh, singular plural dichotomy, uh, perhaps uh, God is using the royal we to bring uh, an elevation to uh, the majesty and the glory of God. And that's certainly a fair interpretation. Uh, can't be dogmatic on that. But it is interesting to see uh, that in the grammar in Genesis, there is uh, hints and allusions to it. You see it later uh, when God creates man. He says, let us make man. Uh, and later on when he confuses the languages in chapter 11, uh, he also says, let us go down. So there's this sense in which God has this internal dialogue between these three persons of the Trinity already hinted at. Uh, next, look uh, back in Genesis at uh, what happens next. God said, God said, this speaks of God having mind and ability to communicate. Uh, this is going to come back at the end of our study. Um, but when he, what he said was, let there be light. Uh, what happens next is light appears. So this speaks of his ability to create and his omnipotence that he can create ex nihilo, out of nothing. Um, if I said light be, not much would happen. When God says light be, the universe lights up. It is a remarkable thing. So from these two verses, uh, within this simple narrative, we have a powerful revelation about the nature of God. And namely for our purposes tonight, we see that he is eternal. We see that he's spiritual, that is that he's a spirit. He doesn't have a body of flesh and bone like I do. Uh, he's outside the created order, omnipotent and possessing rational thought and the ability to communicate. Um, this is going to come back later as well. There are many who believe or understand God to be some sort of impersonal force. I think that we can 
uh, lay a little bit of the blame on Star Wars for that, that it's just this ephemeral, impersonal force that has no will of its own. And I'm going to push back hard against that tonight and emphasize again and again to you that God does indeed have a will, and this should be a great, great comfort to us. As we said nearly a year ago when we began this study, the Bible is in fact a book of progressive revelation. It would be simply impossible for God to just lay out all the truths that he had to give us on the first page of the book. And so we see that uh, as the book goes on, as time and history progress, God reveals more and more of himself, of his character, of his nature, and of his perfect plan for us. It's important here to emphasize that Progressive revelation does not mean superseding revelation. The revelations that come later in the book do not nullify those first revelations that we saw. Rather, they build upon, illuminate, and give color to it. We're not invalidating the scriptures that came before as we look at how these revelations progress. And so while we have a wonderful foundation here in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible is only just beginning to tell us a little bit about the nature, person, and plan of God. As we read on, we see that within the worship of Israel and within the teachings of the prophets, that God is very emphatic that he is the one and only. Uh, the key phrase in the uh, Hebrew prayer day was Deuteronomy 6.4, a phrase I'm sure you're familiar with by now, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is one God. Uh, that is to say, uh, our faith is a monotheistic faith. We hold that there is one and only one true God. And this doesn't come from nowhere. We see that God himself says this uh, to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 5. God speaking says, I am the Lord and there is no other beside me. There is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. And it's fascinating. I've got a few of them lined out in my Bible, but there are some who call Isaiah chapters 40 through 48, the trial of the false gods, where uh, God uh, displays his character and his nature in those chapters in contrast to these uh, foolish, dumb idols that the children of Israel were making and worshiping. And uh, it is just a treasure trove of information about who God is, what he's about. And he says this whole, I am uh, the Lord, there is no other, uh, at least three or four times in that passage. And I would very much encourage you uh, to just uh, look through that passage and you'll see a great deal of truth uh, about our Lord. So if you're looking for a side study, Isaiah 40 through 48, and you look at the singularity of God, that he is, maybe singularity is not exactly the right word, but the fact that he is the one and only true God. So now we can add to our list of things we know about God. Uh, he's eternal, he's spiritual, outside the created order, omnipotent, possessing rational thought and the ability to communicate. And now we know from these verses that he's the only one. He's distinct, he's unique. He's not like me or you, and there is no one comparable to him. Another bit of data that we can mine about uh, this great God that we can wor that we worship is in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, we can add that the Lord does not change. He's immutable. He's unchanging. God speaking to the prophet Malachi says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So we've got a, a baseline that there is one God, right? And we've got a, a baseline of some of the character and attributes uh, of him. But we have to understand that he is transcendent. He is above our ability to know fully. And if we could know him fully, that would be a problem for us because then he wouldn't be very much of a God because I'm not a very smart fellow, am I? And so we, uh, we conclude here with Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. One of my favorites that keeps coming up. I think I've mentioned it probably three or four turns in a row now. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of his law. And so we recognize, we understand, as we try to understand and know God, that he has made a great deal about himself known in the scriptures, but it would take an eternity for us to fully know him, and indeed that's what we're looking forward to. And so our objective tonight is to understand what he has revealed in his word. So against this very brief backdrop about the nature of God, I'd like to advance 
to what we're here to talk about tonight, that the eternal omnipotent God, being one, is eternally existent in three co-equal, co-eternal persons, and that this is revealed throughout the text of Scripture. I'd like to continue in the Old Testament and demonstrate to you that we see the Spirit of God active in the Old Testament. We've, uh, If time would permit us, we could see uh, God the Father worshipped, but we see the Spirit of God active in the Old Testament, and we see the Son prophesied in the Old Testament. First, the Spirit of God active. When one way, uh, one big way we see the revelation of God progress to a more full understanding is the notion that his spirit can fill a person to accomplish God's will. We first see this in the book of Exodus as the children of Israel are uh, given God's law and the order of worship. God uh, sets aside a craftsman by the name of Bezalel to uh, be the foreman for the building of the tabernacle. And God says this to Moses about Bezalel. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. It's one of those verses, it's so brief, it's easy to just sort of overlook what a significant thing that is that's being said there. The Spirit of God is indwelling Bezalel, giving him this uh, supernatural ability to be the foreman and the lead craftsman for the tabernacle. This is sort of an establishing of how the Spirit of God operates in the Old Testament. We see that the Spirit of God uh, falls upon and occupies various persons at various times to accomplish God's will. Uh, We see it further in the book of Judges, a very dark time in the children of Israel's history, um, where they're in constant need of salvation and God provides it through these people called Judges, and it's a routine refrain through there, Uh, so we'll just look at one, the first one, Othniel, if you're looking for a name for your kids, may I suggest Othniel, classic. Uh, In Judges chapter 3 and verse 10, the children of Israel are uh, under oppression once again, they cry out to the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord, God writes for us in Judges 3.10, came upon him, that is Othniel, and he judged Israel. And when he went out to the Lord, the Lord gave Cushath Rishathim, the king of Mesopotamia, to his hand, so he prevailed over Cushath Rishathim. Again, this is just one example of several. We see the Spirit of the Lord falling upon Saul. We see the Spirit of the Lord falling upon David. The Spirit of the Lord filling the prophets as they bring forth his word. So you see the Spirit of God personally interacting with people on this earth uh, to accomplish his purposes. But it's not in the same way that the Spirit of the Lord works in our day, in our time, because we see that the Spirit of the Lord comes and goes. You see it particularly in Saul's uh, narrative accounts. And David prays against this in Psalm chapter 51 and verse 11. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So in the Old Testament time, the Holy Spirit could and did come and work amongst uh, God's people. But it was for limited times and for limited reasons. Uh, Here, after the cross, we are blessed to have the Holy Spirit with us personally and forever. He will not leave us or forsake us. So that's the Holy Spirit active. Now let's see the Son prophesied. I'm going to try to pick it up. I'm on page six. So I've only got that much more to go, guys. Don't worry. Uh, So uh, if you're students of the Word then you know by now that the Old Testament is filled with prophecies of the coming Messiah, the one who will restore right communion between holy God and sinful man. Folded within these prophecies is the hint that this Messiah will be none other than God himself. I'm not going to labor the point by reading all of the dozens and hundreds of prophecies we have about God. I think two, uh, three will do for our purposes tonight. The classic one, the one that we all just finished singing about uh last month at the Advent, is Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. This is a prophecy about the coming Messiah, the one who would save uh, the world and restore a right relationship with God. Isaiah records, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, Again, a very simple statement, yet very, very significant. One worth meditating on is the fact that this Messiah, this one who's going to be born, 
is going to be one and the same as God. I think it's fairly clear there. And there uh, remain yet other prophecies that indicate a distinction between uh, this one and God the Father. Consider the most quoted verse in the New Testament, Psalm chapter 110 and verse 1. This verse is quoted more than any other in the New Testament. I thought that was interesting. Psalm 110 verse 1, the header reads a Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Legacy Standard Bible adds a little bit of clarity here. David speaking says, Yahweh said to my Lord, my Adonai, um, I would not pretend to be able to do better than the writer of Hebrews in offering commentary on this verse. And so I would commend you to Hebrews chapter 1 for a full uh, treatment of it. But for our purposes tonight, I would like to emphasize that we have a remarkable glimpse into a dialogue within the Godhead here. Literally God the Father talking to God the Son. It is a powerful evidence in favor of the deity of the Lord Jesus, and yet his distinction from God the Prover or God the Father. Sorry, proverb was the next big word on my notes there. And even still in the wisdom literature, we see in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, the writer says, Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? And who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established the ends of the earth? The answer to these rhetorical questions is, God did all of those things. What is his name? Or what is his son's name? Surely you know. What an interesting thing for the writer to say, that, that God Almighty would have a son? Uh, all of this is to point out that while the Trinity is clear in the New Testament, it is not at all incompatible with the Old. Namely, it brings into clear focus that which is seen in the activity of God's Spirit among his followers and the prophecies we have of the great Emmanuel, that is, God with us. Everybody likes taking credit for this next quote, uh, and so I actually spent a minute and traced it down to St. Augustine, circa 419 A.D., in the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and in the New, the Old is revealed. And so, while we study this concept of the Trinity, I do think that it is useful to uh, have it in our heads that this isn't some new God that we're worshiping. This is the same God who created the heavens and the earth. Uh, we simply have uh, more data uh, to worship him aright and to follow him that much better. Now, on to the New Testament. At 30 minutes in, we're halfway through. Don't worry, the second half will go faster. Huh? It's so very fast. <laughs> Sorry. You try talking about the Trinity for 45 <laughs> minutes and see if you can catch it all in there. We've spoken at length in the past few months about the deity of each of the three persons of the Godhead. We uh, set a study aside for each, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to emphasize that they are indeed God and can rightly be called so. And then we spent a good amount of time pointing out the personality, that these uh, are distinct persons, that they each have uh, mind, will, and emotions, ability to communicate. And I trust that these studies uh, in the archive uh, have done a sufficient job that we don't have to recover all of that ground today. And so I'd like to uh, show you three, four passages, four passages, uh, where these three are seen uh, together in a short space of time in the New Testament and um, discuss what that would mean uh, for us as far as this doctrine goes. As we move into the New Testament, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity becomes inescapable. You can't get off the, pay, the first page of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 credits uh, the incarnation of our Lord to the Holy Spirit. So you have two of the three members of the Godhead uh, already active there on the first page page. Then in Matthew 3, we have a remarkable occasion where all three persons of the Godhead express themselves in one place at one time in a way that we can actually begin to comprehend, and that is at the baptism of our Lord. Jesus comes down to John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. He's baptized by John, and after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, here we have at this point, Jesus submitting to the perfect plan 
of fulfilling all righteousness. He says permitted it this time, a verse prior. We see the Father speaking and the Holy Spirit descending. And so we can see that there is, in fact, a distinction within these three, I'd say. And it's a remarkable moment that we actually have it on the historical record. Uh, you know, if we had a calendar, we could circle the date. Jesus baptized here. Uh, Among the many things that can and should be said, I see the grace of God in manifesting himself at this time in a way that we can understand. The Trinity is clearly seen in three verses, and we're going to look at those three in turn. Uh, First off, let's look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. This is the Great Commission. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Jesus, in his farewell address to his disciples, says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then in verse 19, he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In giving this great commission, the Lord Jesus assumes the tri-unity of the Godhead, which we preach and in which we baptize. J.I. Packard notes something significant in this verse, and I think that it's worth highlighting here. He says, Christ prescribed baptism, quote, in the name, notice the parentheses there, singular, one God, one name. Uh, I trust that he's done his homework on that, of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the three persons who are one God and to whom Christians commit themselves. So even though we see these three distinct persons by whom we are baptized, we see that they are in fact different persons of the one being that is God. And so uh, that's who we're baptized into, that's who we follow, that's who we submit to, and that's the first place where we see the Trinity on full display in uh, a short span of time. The second place we see the three persons occupying one verse is the last verse of 2 Corinthians. Again, one that I think will be familiar to you. I closed with it last time. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Excuse me. In this beautiful, beautiful benediction, we see the distinct roles of the persons of the Godhead in the life of the believer. Here is as good a place as any to clarify a common point of confusion when we discuss the Trinity, a point I think James White clarifies quite well. Oh, I was already there. Look at that. You guys see where I'm going, free preview. So we see throughout the New Testament that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit uh, interact with us in unique ways and James White uh, points out I think quite well that difference in function does not indicate inferiority in nature so we see that uh, God is the one who sends the the son is the one who obeys and the spirit is the one who quickens us and makes us alive and it's easy for us when we get into these sort of discussions to think, uh, well, that must mean that God's El Jefe and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are sort of the ones who go out and do the work. And uh, I would like, again, to push uh, quite hard against that point. Uh, as we've seen in previous studies, each of these are fully God uh, and they are co-equal um, as we have seen prior. You can't have a sort of God or a kind of God. So if they are worthy of the title of God, then they are indeed God. So we see uh, in different ways uh, that, uh, for example, we're taught to pray to the Father in the name of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, And it's easy for us to make the mistake that there's this hierarchical relationship between the members uh, or that it points to some sort of rank structure. And I would say that this is simply not supported by the biblical text. While each person of the Godhead is revealed to us in distinct ways, this in no way diminishes the deity of any of the members. And finally, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Oh, we've still got a ways to go. Don't think I was saying finally like we're done here. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. You'll notice that we are in the King James Version for this one. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. While we heartily affirm the truth of this passage, I bring it up here more as an advisement or a caution on this verse. For you see, libraries of books have been written about this verse, folks arguing back and forth about it, as to whether it is actually original to the text of 1 John. Uh, The debate is so fierce uh, that these few words have their own name in scholarly circles. This verse is called the Kama Yohannium, specifically uh, those words that appear after the first comma. 
the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It would appear that this second half, that is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, is in addition to the original text. That is, the evidence that we have in brief is that the Greek, the Greek manuscript support for this is minimal, uh, nor ancient. Uh, it appears to have been imported from Latin traditions. None of the church fathers in the first four centuries quoted it uh, when this debate about the Trinity was raging in that time in the church, and they don't explicitly cite it. And it doesn't even appear in the Textus Receptus, the, basis, the base text for the King James, until Erasmus's third edition. And so I'm not trying to take this wonderful verse from you. I'm rather here to caution you that as you discuss these things with friends and families or when those smart folks with the black ties show up on your doorstep, uh, that you might want to exercise caution and, and do a fair amount of study before you uh, turn to this particular verse. Um, unfortunately, I think that this is one area where we are lacking is we don't study enough to where uh, famous apologists and uh uh, Christian student of the cults, Walter Martin said, the average Jehovah's Witness can make a doctrinal pretzel out of the average Christian in about 30 seconds. And this is to our shame, I would say. I believe Dr. Martin is correct, at least in part, because we do not discuss difficulties like the text of 1 John 5, 7 very much, at least not from the pulpit. And I don't want your first time to hear about this to be on the doorstep when the Jehovah's Witnesses throw this in your face. So I'll climb off my soapbox now. Talking about the, the text and manuscript tradition is one of my favorite things. Um, but I would like you to know that if you choose to undertake the study about the text and the manuscript tradition and all of that, uh, I can assure you that you'll walk away with more confidence and not less in the perfect nature of the Word of God, which he has preserved despite trusting it to fallible men to pass from generation to generation, location to location, and language to language. The God we serve is perfect, and his Word is perfect, with or without the comma Johannium. One more fascinating display. So we've seen all three on display, all three persons of the Godhead on display. Uh, but there's another way that we see the Godhead on display in the New Testament. Um, very often you'll see two of three mentioned. Uh, a perfect example would be in those blessings that open most of the epistles. Uh, a good example would be 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul writing, blessing uh, the, the Corinthian church, says grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It might seem funny to bring this up as, uh, as an evidence of the fact that we serve a God who has three distinct persons since only Father, uh, the God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are mentioned. But I would remind you about who's moving the pen of Paul here. Uh, we're told in 1 Peter and Hebrews and Timothy that... Uh, the text of scripture is inspired that the Holy Spirit comes upon uh, the apostles as they write and that they are writing indeed the very words of God. And so while we see God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ named, make no mistake, the Holy Spirit is there also penning these words for us to benefit from and be blessed by. So we've still got a whole lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> and so Sort of to give you a little bit of a speed round, I thought I would suggest some further reading. Um, building the Trinitarian doctrine is, uh, it can be a long study, an involved study, but a worthy study. And so if you're interested in, uh, in reading further on it, I would commend you uh, as a starting place to start at Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, the whole book is really good. Just read the whole Bible, but <laughs> Hebrews chapter one is a wonderful place to start if you want to see the deity of Christ and the and the relationship there between uh, Jesus Christ and God the Father. The later chapters of the Gospel of John, in addition to his prologue there in John chapter one, and one that I really wanted to talk about tonight, so that I could say we went from Genesis to Revelation, but. Alas, the first eight verses of the book of Revelation, we see uh, another wonderful example of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all being recognized and worshipped as God while still remaining distinct persons. So now as we're racing towards our conclusion, uh, last time I was up here, I asked you to hold in your mind the definition that we're defending of the Trinity um, it's an abridged version of what you'll see in the creeds, uh, but I think James White again does it well when he says, Within the one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal, co-eternal persons, namely Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've demonstrated uh, in past weeks, 
again, that each of these uh, persons are uh, ascribed deity, and that they. Uh, and tonight we're looking at how they're co-equal and co-eternal, and how they exist without tension on the pages of Scripture. Because this doctrine can be so overwhelming, uh, it's led to a lot of false doctrines and false teachings. And so, with this definition in mind, I'd like to point out some of the things that we're not saying. We're not saying that we worship many gods. That is an, an idea called polytheism, uh, and that is uh, simply not the case. We affirm and we recognize that while there are three persons of the Trinity, they are indeed one God. So polytheism is the first heresy that we reject. We reject that there is any more than one true God. Likewise, there's an idea called modalism, which maintains that while there is one God, he sort of is a shapeshifter, if you will, to put it in the, in the simplest terms I can think of, that God takes the form of the Father at one moment and the Son in another and the Spirit in still another. Um, and I think we've already poked a, a fair number of holes in that uh, line of thinking, just looking at the text of Scripture tonight, even though it was a uh, brief and fast survey. We see these members of the Trinity uh, again, existing without tension, side by side. Even uh, we see in the later chapters of John that I commended to you um, that the Lord Jesus prays to God the Father. How could a how could a modalist mode of God? How would that work? Was Jesus schizophrenic in that case? No, we recognize that there are three distinct persons, and so Jesus can rightly speak to God his Father. So modalism is another. Uh, heresy that we reject um, okay and the the last one that I'd like to uh, bring up is the idea of subordinationism the idea that there's a rank structure within uh, the, the being of the Godhead uh, there's no scriptural support for this and uh, again as we uh, mentioned briefly earlier um, any being that is God must be fully God and so if we're going to ascribe the title of God uh, to the Holy Spirit, then we recognize that he is every inch as much God as the Lord Jesus, that while they have different roles in our salvation and in the ministry to us and in the way that they interact with us, they are not uh, of lower rank one than another. We further reject the idea that the Father is one-third God and the Son is one-third God and so on, because you see, we saw in the Shema that there is one God. It's not, there's not parts to God. He's, he's one, uh, incredible being. Um, there's so much more to say as far as the development of this theology over time. I wish that I had time to talk to you about the creeds and the early church controversies that led to us, uh, expressing these so clearly. Um, so I'll, uh, suggest, as we're sort of wrapping up here, extra biblical reading, if you will. Uh, the creeds, specifically the Chalcedonian, Nicene, and Anastasian creed, the Blue Letter, Blue Letter Bible offers these with scripture proofs, and they're a wonderful jumping off point for this study. If you can find one with the scripture proofs, uh, you'll be off to the races as far as that. Uh, gotquestions.com has about the best two-page summary of the Trinity that I've ever seen. And so I would commend that to you if what I'm saying is just right over your head. Uh, you're going to read Got Questions and go, why did I listen to that guy for 45 minutes? And then two books, uh, The Forgotten Trinity by R.C. Sproul, a good brief introduction, and The Forgotten Trinity by James White. Uh, James White's treatment is quite a bit thicker. I think R.C. Sproul's is only about 75 pages, but both are wonderful works and I think would bless you greatly. Uh, incidentally, um, if you type in the forgot, what is the Trinity PDF? It's free online on, uh, on different websites. I can, I can show you that. I believe it's by permission, so I can feel safe in saying that. So in conclusion, uh, these studies can sometimes be frustrating and con or confusing, uh, but we're laying a groundwork for what we're going to be discussing more later this year. Now that we've discussed this great and perfect God, it's time to discuss its, his dealings with us. And that's where we're going to be going in this following year. We're going to discuss how he created us, his perfect plan for us, his redemption of us, and so forth. And it's my sincere prayer that while we look long at the wonder and mystery, mystery and power of our great God, that we will make these realities of what he does for us and how he interacts with us 
that much more meaningful to you. And just that notion that God, God interacts with us and God interacts personally with us. This is a unique feature of our faith. You know, in nearly every other faith, you have to travel to Mecca to see God or you have to climb Mount Olympus to see God or there's this forest somewhere where, where God is. But God indeed is near to us um, and he's personal towards us. So the notion of God is one that is not very difficult to get people to, to accept. Even agnostics will acknowledge God as a philosophical necessity. But the worldly concept of God pales in comparison to the actual reality that we enjoy and we understand from the scriptures. For you see, God is more than just a force, more than a power. He's a great God who hears, who knows, who listens. And he willfully created us for his glory and interacts with us to his ends. And beyond that, he's near to us. Consider Jeremiah 23, 23. I am a God who is near, declares the Lord. Or am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Indeed, for those of us who are saved, he is with us personally by his Holy Spirit, so that we can agree with the prophet Micah, our last verse for the night. Though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. What a wonderful thought to think that the God of the universe created us and is with us and will guide us to the end. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you uh, for this time. We ask that it was a blessing. Uh, we pray that you would bless the discussion going forward. Lord, we thank you for being near to us and for revealing yourself to us such as you have. Bless us now, we pray in your name. Amen. Sorry if I biffed it. <laughs>